Thank you. Special, Special Agent for, for, for Chelly. Good morning, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee. I thank you for the opportunity to appear before the committee today. I am here to provide testimony that I hope will assist in your inquiry into the investigation um, that has come to be known as Operation Fast and Furious. I believe that your inquiry is essential. There have been grave mistakes made in this case, and the committee, the American people, and the family of slain Border Patrol agent Brian Terry deserve answers. Please allow me to give you a little background information about myself. In 1987, I began my career with the New York City Police Department and worked in Bronx County, often referred to as the Bronx, as a uniformed police officer and then ultimately as a detective in the Bronx Homicide Task Force. In my career, I estimate that I have responded to approximately 600 homicide scenes. The vast majority were drug-related, committed by armed criminals, and these violent criminals were armed with illegal firearms, and they had little regard for human life. I retired early from the NYPD in June of 2001 to take a position with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, as we were then known, and I did this because I had the honor of working with ATF agents who were working and making great cases, uh, working hand-in-hand -hand with incredible prosecutors uh, from the Southern and Eastern Districts of New York. And working with these officers, one thing was very clear. Dedicated prosecutors worked hand-in-hand -hand with dedicated ATF agents to make great cases that truly impacted the safety of the public. There was an absolute sense of teamwork and respect. Again, I'm going to emphasize the words teamwork and respect. Together with prosecutors from the U.S. Attorney's offices with whom I'd worked, we had used confidential informants, proffers, cooperation agreements, waivers of speedy presentment, investigative grand juries and grand jury subpoenas, and an abundance of other investigative tools to make successful cases as part of a team. I left the New York Field Division in March of 2007 to begin working in my current post of duty as a supervisor of the Phoenix One field office. Within weeks, I was surprised at what I had observed. In my opinion, in my professional opinion, dozens of firearms traffickers were given a pass by the United States Attorney's Office for the District of Arizona. Despite the existence and probable cause, in many cases, there were no indictments, no prosecutions, and criminals were allowed to walk free. In short, their office policies, in my opinion, helped pave a dangerous path. Fortunately, the same could not be said of the Arizona Attorney General's Office, State Prosecutors, to which we agents were forced to turn for prosecution of firearms cases. Victor Varela and his associates, who trafficked 50 caliber rifles directly to Mexican drug cartels, one of which was used to, to kill a Mexican military commander, were successfully prosecuted by the Arizona Attorney General's Office. And this was after the case had been declined for Federal prosecution by Assistant U.S. Attorney Emory Hurley due to what he referred to as corpus delecti issues. Mr. Varela sadly was released from prison last July because of the lesser, se lesser sentencing guidelines uh, that apply in State court. But the alternative, no prosecution, in my eyes, was unacceptable. Another case, which involved a corrupt Federal firearms licensee uh, who was supplying several firearms or trafficking organizations, uh, was declined by Mr. Hurley. This particular dealer in his post-arrest statement admitted that approximately 1,000 of his firearms were trafficked to Mexico. Over one half dozen of that dealer's firearms were located around the body of Arturo Beltran Leyva, the head of the Beltran Leyva cartel, went after his body after he was killed uh, in a gun battle with the Mexican Naval Infantry in Cuernavaca, Mexico. Due to the recalcitrance of the United States Attorney's Office, cases such as these were prevented, presented for prosecution to the Arizona, uh, Arizona Attorney General's Office, where the State laws carried significantly lesser penalties than they did under the Federal statutes. And I believe that it is this situation uh, where in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Arizona in Phoenix, particularly, declined most of our firearms cases was at least one factor which led to the debacle that is now known as Operation Fast and Furious. And I will fast forward to Operation Fast and Furious itself. ATF agents assigned to the Phoenix Field Division with the concurrence of their chain of command walked guns. ATF agents allowed weapons to be provided to individuals who they knew would traffic them to members of the Me Mexican drug trafficking organizations. They did so by failing to lawfully interdict the weapons, and they did so by encouraging Federal firearms licensees to continue selling weapons in instances where they knew that no interdic interdiction efforts would be planned. When I, when I voiced surprise and concern with this tactic to ASAC uh, George Gillette and SAC William Newell, my concerns were dismissed. SAC Newell referred to the case as groundbreaking and bragged that we were the only people in the country doing this. My other ASAC Jim Needles merely said, Pete, you know that if you or I were on the case, it wouldn't be getting run this way. This operation, which in my opinion endangered the American public, was orchestrated in conjunction with Assistant U.S. Attorney Emory Hurley, 
the same assistant U.S. attorney who prevented us from using some of the common and accepted law enforcement techniques utilized elsewhere in the United States. I have read documents that indicate that his boss, U.S. Attorney Dennis Burke, also agreed with the direction of this case. Allowing firearms to be trafficked to criminals is a dangerous and deadly strategy. The thought that the techniques used in the Fast and Furious investigation would result in taking down a cartel, given the toothless nature of the straw purchasing law and the lack of a strong firearms trafficking statute is, in my opinion, delusional. Based upon my conversations with agents who had assisted in this case, surveillance was often terminated on individuals far from the border, which means that while the case agent believed that these weapons were destined for Mexico, the possibility exists that they were trafficked with cartel drugs to other points within the United States of America. As a career law, law enforcement officer who has had the, to investigate the deaths of police officers, children, and others at the hands of armed criminals, I was and continue to be horrified, truly horrified. I believe that these firearms will continue to turn up at crime scenes on both sides of the border for years to come. In closing, I want members of the committee and all Americans to know that this is not how ATF agents conduct business. I am very proud of some of the incredible work done by ATF agents around the country every day. ATF agents have given their lives in the performance of duty. On my last trip back to New York, sir, I had the privilege of being present for a homicide trial. Uh, in that same courthouse in the Southern District of New York, there were three other separate homicide trials going on, all from three separate ATF-initiated investigations. That is the type of work ATF agents do every day, and that is what I would like the committee to keep in mind as well. Um, I thank you for your time, and again, my condolences to the Terry family. I thank you. I thank all of our witnesses. I will now recognize myself for the first uh, round of questioning. Mrs. Terry.